Welcome um, to our discussion uh, today on canine hypothyroidism. I'm going to use the next hour to try to give you a little skinny on the fat. Jumping right in, uh, a little um, factoid is that the thyroid gland was named after the Greek word theros or shield because of its shape. And it, the thyroid system runs on a negative feedback, uh, which going from the top, the hypothalamus makes and releases the thyrotropin releasing hormone, which works on the pituitary gland to have it produce uh, TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone and release it into the system, which then stimulates the thyroid gland to make uh, the thyroid hormones T3 and T4. For the purpose of this discussion, because we are going to be talking about diagnostics, we're really only going to talk about T4 since there hasn't been um, any real evidence so far that T3 is useful in the diagnosis of a healthy or a diseased state in the cat and dog. So as those hot thyroid hormones uh, begin to accumulate in the system, a signal is sent back to the brain that we no longer need the stimulatory signals and those signals are reduced and therefore the thyroid level is kept um, in check or in homeostasis. In a hypothyroid dog, um, one of two things can happen to um, eliminate or reduce the production of the thyroid hormones. In primary hypothyroidism, the problem is with the gland itself. The gland is unable to produce the thyroid hormones, which then sends a strong signal to the brain to have the brain produce and release the thyroid stimulating hormone. So in this case, the hormone levels are low and the thyroid stimulating hormone levels are high. In secondary hypothyroidism, which is rare, the problem lies at the level of the pituitary gland in such that the pituitary gland is not able to produce and or release the thyroid stimulating hormone so that the thyroid gland gets basically no stimulation. In this case, the thyroid stimulating hormone will be low as well as the levels of the thyroid hormone. Tertiary hypothyroidism has not been reported in dogs, so we're not going to spend any time on that. There are basically two forms of thyroid disease in the dog. Hypothyroid can have a congenital cause or it can be acquired um, as the dog matures. The congenital form is rare and it has a lot of different things that can result in a dog not being able to make or use the thyroid hormone uh, successfully. One of these uh, causes that used to be more common than it is today is nutritional iodine deficiency. But thankfully with all the science and our current foods, um, that is much, much, much less rare than it used to be. Other causes include thyroid gland agenesis, dysregulated hormone production, malformed reception or receptors, and even pituitary dwarfism in which all the hormones produced by the pituitary are absent with the exception of ACTH. The acquired form of, of primary hypothyroidism is caused by one of two things. Thyroid atrophy, which is the natural slow death of the thyroid gland over time, or a condition called lymphocytic thyroiditis, which is an immune-mediated inflammatory process that slowly destroys the thyroid gland. There are other causes of hypothyroidism that are very rare in dogs and really occur more commonly in cats, um, which result after uh, surgery or radioactive iodine treatment or oral therapy. So again, these are mostly seen in cats that are treated for hyperthyroid disease. Lymphocytic thyroiditis um, is a, again, a inflammatory immune mediated process that is usually detected in the middle aged dogs and is believed to have a juvenile onset 
So we, we see these in adult dogs, but it'll start in the very early years of life, but it takes that long for us to be able to catch the signs or symptoms that we need in order to diagnose it. There are definitely breed predispositions for lymphocytic thyroiditis, and this is not by all means an exhaustive list of dogs that are affected. But the big point with lymphocytic thyroiditis is that not all dogs with thyroiditis will develop hypothyroidism. And not all dogs with hypothyroidism will have had thyroiditis. So it creates a bit of a quandary in discussing um, the cause of hypothyroidism in every dog. The stages of hypothyroid, lymphocytic hypothyroidism is, are important to know because it really demonstrates the very slow, meticulous process of thyroid disease. In stage one, which is called subclinical thyroiditis, the animal becomes uh, autoantibody positive, but they will have no clinical symptoms and no hormone abnormalities. So normal T4, normal TSH, but antibody positive. As they move into stage two, 60 to 70% of the functional thyroid mass has been destroyed. And yet still, we are only subclinical hypothyroid. So in other words, this dog will be antibody positive with most likely normal T4 levels and most likely normal TSH levels, but we may also see just a bit of a rise in TSH as they, they go into uh, the next stage which is clinical hypothyroidism, at which point 75 to 80% of the thyroid, functional thyroid mass has been destroyed. These are the dogs that we typically diagnose with hypothyroidism because they are now clinical and showing signs that we can relate to the disease. They will be antibody positive, have, typically have a low T4 and an elevated TSH in the most straightforward cases. Um, and these are the dogs that are going to be showing dermatologic or metabolic signs uh, or a number of different things we would see on physical exam. And finally, stage four is thyroid atrophy. This is the complete destruction of the thyroid gland with the result of no function. These dogs will actually be antibody negative. They will have no, they will have very low T4, very high TSH most of the time, and they will be clinically ill. So there's a large debate among the veterinary community that stage four is actually, the thyroid atrophy is actually simply stage four of thyroiditis um, instead of being its own disease state uh, all on its own. So that's a huge debate. And again, we don't really know the full story yet but we currently believe that about 50% of the dogs that are hypothyroid become that way because of thyroid atrophy and 50% of dogs that are hypothyroid become that way because of this thyroiditis condition. And why is this important? It's important because thyroid disease is very slow to come on. If we look at the dog on the left, we can see a beautiful golden retriever that's maybe a little too fluffy for his own good. The middle dog has some hair coat changes, especially in color, and arguably a little bit of hair loss on his rump. And the third dog on the right is systemically ill. You can see he's got a catheter in him. He's got generalized patchy alopecia with flaky skin, and he just feels bad. And the importance of this is that th these three dogs could all be hypothyroid and their symptoms could be caused by hypothyroidism alone, or they could all be completely euthyroid and not have any thyroid disease at all, but other things are causing the symptoms that we see. So this is not an easy or straightforward disease to diagnose. And this is because the thyroid hormone is involved in every part of the body. And as a result, every part of the body has an effect on the thyroid gland as well. It's involved in development, 
large or major organ function. We know that the kidneys are very important in the cat disease, muscle development and breakdown, energy level and all forms of metabolism, including things like insulin sensitivity and digestion, and of course, cardiovascular function. In the dog, we can easily see bradycardia or decreased uh, blood pressure as a result of hypothyroidism. So I like to think of the thyroid hormones um, and the thyroid gland as the boss. I mean, it's literally in charge of everything our bodies do. So what happens when the boss doesn't show up for work? Well, there was a very interesting article that came out about a year ago that found significant changes in metabolites that are critical to DNA synthesis between hypothyroid dogs and healthy dogs. So this is telling us that this disease can actually affect our patients all the way down to the level of their own DNA, which is crazy. Now, we're not gonna see that on a physical exam, so let's talk about what we will see on a physical exam. The most common uh, clinical signs of hypothyroidism have to do with the skin and coat and the metabolic rate. About 60 to 80% of dogs with hypothyroidism will have coat changes such as uh, coat color change, hair loss, their coat could be dry or brittle. They can have hyperpigmentation, hyperlichenification, seborrhea, pyoderma, and even in the most severe cases, myxedema. Uh, weight gain is also another huge sign of hypothyroidism, but it's interesting to know that only about 40% of dogs that are hypothyroid are actually obese. So we need to make sure to include questions in our history that better help us discern um, the activity level of the patient and behaviors like heat seeking. Um, and then also pay attention to uh, exam findings like corneal lipid deposits that can tip us off to metabolic uh, problems. Because, when we have a dog that comes in that looks like this, especially where I am in the southeast, there are a number of things that can cause this besides hypothyroidism. And of course, we want to make that diagnosis so that we can help the dog and make it feel better. But we have to do a lot of sorting in the history. Um, if we find out that grandma just moved in with the family six months ago and she has a very bad habit of feeding the dog all of her table scraps, which they can't break her of, this may explain the 10 pounds of weight gain that the dog has had in the last six months. And the patchy hair loss um, on first sight may concern you about hypothyroidism, but then you may find out that they had forgotten to give the flea prevention for a couple of months and then restarted it last month and the dog is already feeling better. Other chronic changes like the hyperpigmentation are usually a little bit more specific to skin disease and or metabolic problems. So you could add those to your positives for the diagnosis of hypothyroid. But the point is we have to be thorough in every aspect of our history taking in our exam to convince ourselves that thyroid problems are on our differential list. Other bodily signs um, and systems that are affected would include the neurologic system. There was a study of hypothyroid dogs done a few years ago that showed that one third of the dogs enrolled in the study actually had neurologic abnormalities, the most common of which was seizures. Um, there are a list of uh, common neurologic symptoms in dogs that we can see, and you can see that it even does include a myxedema coma, these thankfully are very rare because hopefully with our good medicine, dogs will be uh, identified as hypothyroid before they reach that state. Also the cardiovascular system, we mentioned bradycardia and hypotension as things that we can uh, discover on our physical exam. Constipation could be part of the history or the physical exam if you can palpate a large amount of stool in the colon and even reproductive problems can be seen. So with all of this information, 
Why isn't the diagnosis of hypothyroid straightforward? Well, you know, there are a lot of clues out there, like the little guy on the left, he's way too rotund for his size, so he could be hypothyroid. And the guy in the middle obviously might have mixed edema, so he could have hypothyroid. And the dog on the right has patchy hair loss on his rump, so he could be hypothyroid. But the fact of the matter is that many other conditions cause similar physical exam findings. And we have to really consider that when we're putting hypothyroid on our list of differentials. What else can cause what we're seeing? There are also very few routine laboratory changes that we see with hypothyroid dogs. And to make matters worse, not all of them follow the rules. In fact, hypercholesterolemia is a great red flag for hypothyroidism, but a quarter of the dogs do not show any abnormalities at all on their chemistry panel. And you may or may not see a non-regenerative mild anemia. And the worst thing for us to remember is that thyroid hormones are influenced by so many other factors. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. We um, just wanted to take a quick reminder here and go over the fact that when we talk about thyroid hormones in the system, that 99% of the thyroxine that we are discussing is protein bound. It basically serves as an inactive biologic reservoir for the active form, which is only 1% of the, um, the total thyroxine in the system. So this thyroxine is non-protein bound and can carry the hormonal signal into the cell uh, to get the desired effect. But the rest of the thyroid hormone is bound and inactive and floating around the system. So you can see that uh, diseases or factors that affect protein binding can also affect the amount of thyroxine in the system for the dog. This slide actually represents about 20 years of research um, within these different categories of factors influencing thyroid hormones. So we'll go over each one. Age is a big important cause. Um, again, along with fat hairless dogs, I also have to be, also happen to be a fan of geriatrics. So we need to be cognizant of the fact that older dogs will have a lower T4 and free T4 naturally, but our reference ranges are made from dogs that are all ages that are normal. So we don't have a quote unquote normal reference range for dogs 10 and up. Breed is another important characteristic to consider when we're working up patients for thyroid disease. You have to consider whether the dog is prone to having hypothyroidism, but you also need to consider if the dog is a breed that may naturally have lower T4 and free T4 and possibly higher TSH than other breeds. And a great group of dogs to represent this challenge is the sight hounds. Fitness is also a, a major influence on thyroid hormones and the fact that um, naturally active or athletic dogs are far more likely to have a lower T4 than those dogs whose full-time job it is to hold down the couch pillows like my own dogs. Um, so we need, to, we need to make sure that we keep that in mind that what is the lifestyle of the dog? Does it have a job? Um, what does it do through the day and how active is it? We know that drugs can certainly, certain classes of drugs can certainly depress the T4 and the free T4, which makes our uh, test reading sometimes fairly challenging. The major groups that we see regularly would be steroids and phenobarbital, but I wanted to point out to the group that sulfa drugs can also cause uh, a temporary hypothyroidism. But what's interesting about the sulfa drugs is they actually cause a functional hypothyroidism, which means not only do they decrease the thyroid hormones, but they also increase the thyroid stimulating hormone. Um, so just keep that in mind if you are 
if you see a dog who's on a sulfa drug and you're worried about hypothyroidism, um, you just may want to wait until they come off the drug before you do any testing. And finally, the last category is certainly not the least. Um, thyroid, thyroid function is directly affected by non-thyroidal illness present in the dog. So we have to be very careful and cognizant of what other comorbidities are present in our patient before we start our th thyroid workout and consider how those diseases may affect our test results. Just a quick note on thyroid autoantibodies. When a dog becomes um, uh, positive for uh, lymphocytic thyroiditis, the dog is actually making antibodies to thyroglobulins, proteins. And then a small portion of the dogs that are forming these thyroglobulin antibodies will spin off and form the autoantibodies to uh, the thyroid hormones. Only about 15% of hypothyroid dogs will have anti-T4 antibodies. And by 15%, what I mean is 15% of the 50% that are positive lymphocytic thyroiditis hypothyroid dogs. So this is a small po population of dogs that we do deal with. Um, but what happens is, is that the anti-T4 antibodies can cause false elevations in our T4 levels and make diagnosing these dogs with hypothyroid very challenging. So let's talk about the thyroid hormones that we use to diagnose this disease in our patients. First of all, T4, we're all pretty comfortable, I'm sure, um, with looking at T4, since generally speaking, they are um, a part of a minimum data pa panel. But we need to be reminded that a low T4 is never diagnostic of hypothyroidism. I don't care if the dog has symptoms, if you've only got a low T4, that is not diagnostic and you need to run additional tests. The reason is, is this test is a sensitive test and a T4 within the reference range or completely normal helps rule the disease out. And a reminder also that reference ranges are instrument specific. So when you're running a test, you want to make sure that the results that you get are being compared to the reference range for the modality that you are using. Free T4 is also a very highly sensitive test, especially when it's done by equilibrium dialysis. In fact, when equilibrium dialysis is used, the test is about 95% sensitive, which means that a normal or negative result helps rule the disease out. Unfortunately, ED is less available these days than it used to be, um, and other assays are being used instead of ED in many cases, unless there is a specific quest for the ED methodology. These methods have lower sensitivities but are in regular use uh, by the reference labs. And free T4, some important points is they are less, uh, free T4 is less impacted by non thyroidal illness, by uh, drugs, and by antibodies. So this doesn't mean they're not affected, this, this hormone is not affected at all, it just means it's less affected. And this hormone alone cannot confirm disease all by itself. And in certain situations cannot um, confirm disease even with the combination with a low T4. So it's a great test, but not foolproof. And let's take a look at the thyroid stimulating hormone. This is kind of our last shot of, at the perfect test, which I'm sorry to inform you, it is not. The TSH cannot diagnose hypothyroidism on its own because while we catch 70% of the hypothyroid dogs with an elevated TSH, the TSH can actually be normal in 30% of cases of dogs that are actually afflicted by hypothyroidism. And why is that? It may be that there are limitations to our assays, that we still don't have that great test to discern um, these hormones. It could be as a normal daily variability, 
could be as a result of secondary thyroid disease, um, secondary hypothyroidism, where remember that the TSH production is deficient. And it also could be, there's a theory that um, with the chronically low levels of thyroid in a hypothyroid dog, that the constant stimulation of the pituitary gland to produce the TSH, it may actually just be a progressive loss of sensitivity of the pituitary gland to respond to the low level of T4. So there are a lot of theories out there why this test is not perfect, but we just have to keep in mind that we can catch 70% uh, of the cases of hypothyroid with a positive or an elevated TSH and a low T4, but there are those cases that will have normal TSH, which makes the diagnosis frustrating. So we've talked about a lot of exceptions and rules. So just a quick summary to go over everything that we have uh, gone on as far as the thyroid hormones go. And that is that a normal T4 rules out hypothyroidism. And by normal, we need solidly normal, not like 1.1. A low total T4 or a free T4 does not confirm hypothyroidism on its own. A low T4 and a low free T4 is highly suspicious, but not definitive in all cases. A high TSH does not confirm hypothyroidism alone. It must be paired with a decrease in the T4 level or a low, T or low free T4. A normal TSH does not rule it out. So the point here is that it takes more than one test to make the diagnosis of hypothyroidism in our canine patients. So what does all of this mean? It means that as veterinarians, we need to slow our roll just a little bit when we are considering patients with hypothyroid disease. We need to do our due diligence to rule out other causes of the symptoms that we are seeing and run tests so that we are positive that we have the diagnosis of hypothyroidism before we begin lifelong treatment. And to do that, we need to really evaluate the full thyroid panel. This is like a puzzle that we're working and it's most effective when we have all three pieces of the puzzle to put together to give our diagnosis. So where do we start? Have a list of four questions that if you remember through every case that you work up for hypothyroidism will be really helpful um, to you as you go through it. So you can talk yourself in or out of the diagnosis as you go along. The most important question seems like an obvious one, but does the pet have clinical signs of hypothyroidism? Do you believe when you look at this dog that thyroid should be on the list of differentials? What is the signalment of the dog? Is this a breed that is naturally predisposed to hypothyroidism or is this a breed that is going to give you challenges when you read the thyroid hormone results? Is the pet on medication that would impact testing? And do the results of the minimum database support hypothyroidism or do they support concurrent non-thyroidal illness? So let's look at a few cases to kind of go over these questions. So this is Hunter. He is a seven-year-old male neutered golden retriever who presents for his annual exam with his dad with no complaints really other than dad mentioned that he's really shedding a lot and you can see that um, he has a little bit of hair loss right here uh, behind his angel wing. His coat is a little thin. So just by the nature of the fact that he is a seven-year-old dog and a golden retriever, we know that we want to send some annual blood work off and we're definitely going to send a CBC and a chemistry to get a minimum database, but we want to add in some thyroid testing because we're a little worried with his breed and his signaling. So how are we going to do that? Are we going to simply request a T4? Are we going to add in a free T4 and or a TSH? We're going to do a full thyroid panel. And then the question is, 
where? Where are we going to do that? Are we going to do all the um, diagnosis in-house? Are we going to do all of it at a reference lab? Are we going to do a mixture of both? Well, it's kind of like spinning the wheel sometimes when we're trying to figure out what is best for a patient. Um, and in this case, we spun the wheel. And in Hunter's uh, case, we sent off a minimum database with a T4, which came back within normal limits. But looking at the T4, it's at 1.1 and we have a dog that is somewhat symptomatic. So let's review our questions. Does Hunter have clinical signs? And I think the answer is yes. I mean, he has definitely got a patch of hair loss um, laterally. So that would be enough for me to consider hypothyroidism. Is he a breed that is at risk? Yes, golden retrievers are known for hypothyroidism. He's not on any medications, at least that were shared with us in the history, and his routine minimum database gave us no clues, basically, except for a low normal thyroid. So what happens if we run a whole thyroid panel in-house? And we see that the thyroid, the T4, is still 1.1, which is what we got from the reference lab, low normal. The free T4 is actually four out of six, which is a tad bit low, and the TSH is 0.63 out of 0.46. So the TSH is actually high. So this dog um, is hypothyroid and needs to be started on um, thyroid supplementa supplementation and monitoring. So I'd like to take this time to introduce the Truforma. Um, the Truforma is an in-house endocrine machine that runs the T4 and the only feline optimized TSH in cats and is capable of running a full thyroid panel, a T4, a free T4, and a TSH, as well as cortisol and the only point of care endogenous ACTH. And I would also like to give a shout out to our Zometica scientists who are wonderfully smart people who do not take okay as good enough. Um, for those of you who may not um, understand what you're looking, don't worry, I didn't really understand any of this when I started my job here either, because it's not stuff that we look at every single day when we're in practice. Um, there are a number of different um, tests of analytical measurements that uh, a new modality must go through to prove that they're useful in a hospital space. And the Clinical Laboratory Standards Institutes regulates what are the cutoffs or the, the requirements for the test to be useful. So the Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute says that any machine that has precision, which is the measurement of repeatability, um, under 25% CV is okay. Well, our scientists didn't think that that was okay, and they said they would not accept anything less than 20% CV which you can see we clearly got on all of our precision testing across our assays. Correlation is another test of analytical procedure. And in this test, we're actually comparing a new methodology, which would be our Truforma, to a gold standard, which is the Emulate 2000. And this test, basically what we're looking for is an R value of close to one, as close to one as possible, and a uh, y or slope of the line value of close as close to one as possible. You can see that we got excellent results again across the board for all three of our thyroid hormone assays. And to add a little bit more proof to the pudding, as they say, um, we have an early clinical correlation pilot study that I would like to share in which we took a group of dogs and had them present to their regular veterinarian at day zero and at day 30, at which, and during which those visits, they were given a physical exam and had blood taken to run samples both on the Truforma and at a reference lab. And the veterinarians were asked to uh, give a diagnosis of hypothyroid or euthyroid at the time of the exam. 
And what we found is that Truforma's clinical performance was extremely comparable to the reference lab um, and that all clinical decision-making was actually equivalent, which is just what you want. Um, and in the case where a doctor and Truforma disagreed, um, the Truforma was in complete alignment with the results of the reference lab. And eventually, if the doctor's initial diagnosis differed from their 30-day diagnosis, uh, the final diagnosis actually matched Truforma's initial interpretation. So really excellent and exciting results. We have a larger study underway and we'll be happy to share those results once they come out. Let's go over a few cases though, because this is one of my favorite parts of talks. I would like to introduce you to a six-year-old female spade beagle named Bess. Bess was diagnosed about three years ago with cluster seizures and was started on phenobarbital and potassium bromide and has not had any senior seizures since then. She also comes with a history of hypercholesterolemia and hypertriglyceridemia. Um, and for that, she is on omega-3 fatty acids, ursodiol, and the WD diet. But the owner is really frustrated because she is having a lot of difficulty losing weight, especially over the last few years. And here's Bess. Isn't she pretty in her little bandana? I know when we look at a dog like Bess, we all just have a little lurch in our heart. And because we know that by the simple act of being able to get her body condition debt score down to a normal number, we will extend the quantity of her life and improve the quality of her life all at once. So we really want to make the diagnosis of hypothyroidism here, but she presents a couple of challenges in the fact that she's got a pre-existing condition with seizures and she's obese. So she has two different coexisting diseases at the time of her workup. And she's also on anti-seizural drugs, which we know will affect our thyroid testing results. So again, back to our questions. Does best have clinical signs? And the answer is yes. Is she a breed that is overly affected by uh, hypothyroidism? And I think we do see a fair number of beagles that are hypothyroid. Is she on medications that uh, are known to affect our thyroid results? And the answer is certainly she's on anti-convulsive drugs and we know those affect our results. And then what does her minimum um, database tell us? So with BEST, we're not gonna mess around with sending it to the reference lab. We're gonna do these tests right in-house and we're gonna include an entire thyroid panel. And we see that she is still hyperlipidemic with elevated liver enzymes, but a normal hematocrit. Her thyroid is 0.42, which is indeed low, and her pre-T4 is three, which is also low. But remember, she's got two existing um, pre, she's got two pre-existing conditions, as well as is on a medication that can decrease both the T4 and le to lesser extent the free T4. So those values are useful, but not completely telling. It's not until we look at the thyroid stimulating hormone, which is clearly elevated, that we get the full picture of Bess's diagnosis, which is hypothyroid. So now we can move on um, to treating Bess and helping her heal from her hypothyroidism. So we're gonna start her on a dose of a half milligram levothyroxine at BID. So about a week later, her owner calls because she's got screaming diarrhea. So she's advised to decrease that dose to one pill a day um, and then recheck in 30 days, which she does. And when she comes in, you can see that we have elevated T4 and free T4 values, as well as a very low TSH, which is indicative of thyroid toxicosis. And really, all we have to do is adjust her dose um, and we can correct this, but it's a good chance to remind everybody to make sure that you're using your levothyroxine doses based on a lean body mass instead of the current body mass. It makes a big difference. 
Louie is an eight-year-old male neuter pit bull. Um, he presented for wellness with no complaints. Um, he is very active, likes to chase the ball. In fact, he likes to chase it so much that he ran out a few years ago and got hit by a car, which resulted in a femur fraction or fracture and as a result, chronic osteoarthritis. For the osteoarthritis, he is currently on galloprant, cosequin, and fish oil. Does Louie have clinical signs? I would say not really. I mean, he's a little over conditioned, um, but as we all know, that can just be the result of too many calories in the diet. He's not really a breed that we would uh, be wholly suspicious for hypothyroidism. He's not really on any medications that would affect our testing and his routine minimum database is completely within normal limits. And when we do that blood testing, we get a T4 of 2.1. So with a solidly normal T4 and a dog without any clinical symptoms, I think that we can be done with this case and move on. However, what if we had spun the wheel and we got a T4 of one? Now what do we do? I still think with a dog that is asymptomatic, this may be something that you want to talk to the owner about potentially de the development of clinical signs to have that on their radar. And when you, you do that with these owners, they are very concerned and they want everything done. So they ask you, are there any more tests that you can run? And you say, well, sure, I've got some leftover blood from Louie. I can run a free T4 and a TSH to put this matter of hypothyroidism to rest. And so you do. The free T4 value is solidly normal, but the TSH value is creeping up to the higher end, although solidly normal. Again, at this point, you could be done and feel really great about the fact that you have ruled out hypothyroidism, but you are talking to the owners again about the results, and again, they are insistent. We just wanna know for sure, is there any other test that you can do? So you say, sure we can send out an antithyroid antibody panel. And you can see that he came back T3 and T4 autoantibody negative. And he does have a positive result on his thyroglobulin autoantibodies. So his diagnosis is autoimmune thyroiditis without clinical hypothyroidism. So this will give us a chance to talk to the owner about um, monitor, regular monitoring in the hospital as well as for symptoms at home and just make sure that if he is going to develop hypothyroidism that we catch it earlier rather than later, um, but also can be aware that he may never actually develop hypothyroidism. And finally, this is my favorite case because it actually comes with video. This is Brandy. She is an eight-year-old female spayed Labrador with a progressive right-sided head tilt. And this poor girl really thinks the world is perpendicular to the way she stands. Um, she has a history of well-regulated diabetes, but she's at the higher end of the dose for her insulin. She's slightly over-conditioned with a body condition score of six out of nine. And her hair coat is just brittle on exam with dry scaling diffusely and patchy hair regrowth at the site where her freestyle was attached. And on closer inspection, we noticed that Brandy is trying really hard to look more like a Sharpay than a Labrador. So does Brandy have clinical signs? Heck yes, she does. Is she a breed that is affected by hypothyroidism? Heck yes, Labradors get hypothyroidism. Is she on medications that would adversely affect our testing? No, insulin should not affect the thyroid testing at all. And what about a routine minimum database? Um, we don't have one handy, but we know she has a history of diabetes, so we expect some abnormalities there. But we're not messing around with her. We are going to go ahead and do a full thyroid panel. Um, and we see that the T4 and the free T4 are once again low. 
which we know she has an underlying disease. Um, so that's not entirely surprising. But when we look at the thyroid stimulating hormone, um, the TSH value is clearly elevated. So this gives us our diagnosis uh, along with the decreased T4 and free T4 of hypothyroidism. And we're able to treat Brandy. Here is Brandy two months um, after her initial diagnosis. Um, doing absolutely wonderful, lost a few pounds. In fact, her insulin dose was decreased twice um, over the course of her monitoring thus far, and she is doing absolutely amazing. So here is a situation where a simple panel of thyroid blood work um, instead of a $3,000 MRI of her head saved this dog's life potentially. So really cool case. And as a wrap up, the skinny on the canine hypothyroidism is that typically our patients are middle-aged large breeds, but we know for sure that there are definitely exceptions to that. Dermatologic signs and low metabolism or weight gain are things that we absolutely see very commonly with this disease, but they can look like a whole bunch of other things. Hypercholesterolemia is really our only red flag in the blood work, um, but it's not even 100% consistent. T4 screening is great to help us rule the disease out. And if the T4 is low, we need to do more tests. Really, we recommend doing a thyroid, a whole thyroid panel to establish and clarify the diagnosis of hypothyroidism. And I thank you for your time and attention. And uh, Susan, I guess we'll just open for questions. Yes.